Welcome to the Strategic Investor. Join us as we interview some of the world's most productive asset managers and uncover sophisticated and unique investment strategies in the markets. Here is your host, Charlie Wright. Hello and welcome again to Strategic Investor Radio on OC Talk Radio, where we bring you investment strategies you are not hearing elsewhere. That is certainly the case today. We'd like to welcome Gary Harloff, Ph.D. in Engineering a principal at Harloff Capital Management and founder of Harloff Capital Management. Uh, He's also a hedge fund manager and editor of the Intelligent Fund Investor. He speaks to us from their headquarters outside of Cleveland, Ohio, where it's snowing today. Gary, welcome to Strategic Investor Radio. Hi, thank you for having me today, Charlie. So, Gary, you're a young guy like me. You received your Ph.D. some time back in aerospace engineering. And uh, your work experience is, I hope our whole audience gets this, model building and analysis from computational fluid dynamics of supersonic inlets, hypersonic vehicle design, etc., etc. So, no question about it, you and I would have difficulty talking about such things over dinner. So give us a short background of yours, will you? And you started, uh, you formed Harloff Capital Management in 1994. So tell us about your background history here. Right. Well, Charlie, I started out on the farm upstate New York, and when I was 12 years old, I saw Sputnik fly overhead. And I was uh, very interested in in Sputnik uh, in those days, and I took an interest, and from high school I went to University of Texas in Austin to study aerospace engineering. And the first week there, uh, the dean of engineering came out and got all the freshmen in one room, and he said, shake hands with front, back, side, left side, right side, because only one of you is going to graduate in the en- aerospace engineering department. And that's the way it turned out. Only one, one of five could, uh, could graduate. And so that's how I started out. And engineering uh, took my interest for many years, and I found out over the years that I liked uh, computer simulation of this and that. One thing led to the other, and I uh, first went to work at Boeing and did some supersonic inlet calculations that were state-of-the-art at the time. I, I studied uh, how, how fast and how strong inlet shock waves were inside the inlet when the uh, compressor stopped working. And uh, I I've long wondered about that, you know, Gary. We'll have to talk about that <laughs> offline sometime. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, I moved around a little bit from uh, from Boeing and uh, went to uh, West Palm Beach, and I worked at Pratt and Whitney on jet engine stability from a computational standpoint. And one uh, one uh, lunch time, I had lunch with a computer analyst, and he said to me that nobody can model the stock market. And that tweaked my interest. That was quite a while ago. Uh, I've been trying to uh, model the stock market ever since, and so I'm all self-taught in this area. I read a tremendous amount of stuff and did a tremendous amount of original research over the years. And uh, uh, later on, uh, I, I worked at uh, DOE in Oak Ridge on uranium solution mining, and I did a lot of computational work there. And after that, came to NASA, uh, where I worked in computational fluid dynamics, as you said, and other areas. And I uh, entered a, uh, two different contests that were one year long, and, and they were in the area of uh, mutual fund switching. That's where you buy uh, some basket of mutual funds and then you trade it after uh, so long. And I started doing this uh, trading at least once a month, maybe faster than that. And after one year, I was uh, finished fifth place. The first year I entered, and the next year I finished third place in the United States. So I had some sense that I was uh, reasonably competitive on a national scale at that point. And a few years later, I, I left NASA uh, to work uh, for my own firm and to do computational work in the investment area. And almost all of the stuff I do now is based on my own original research. I don't believe in most other people's work. Uh, I guess that's the nature of, of the beast that I 
that I am at this point. Okay. And so I started a fee-based uh, registered investment advisory firm in 94, as you said, and uh, we're a fiduciary, and we put our clients first. I was in a, another contest a few years later, 1999. Steve Shellens, who's passed now, uh, had been tasked by someone that he knew to start a newsletter so that this wealthy investor could figure out who the market timers were for mutual funds. And so I got in that database, and in 1999, I got the highest return in the, for the previous 15 years that Steve Shellens had monitored. And uh, I've been monitored by Timer Digest for many, many years now, and they featured me on their cover uh, five times, and I'm supposed to be featured this month as well. And uh, often I'm in the top ten timers in the United States of, of somewhere north of 100 different uh, timers. So I do market timing, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, I guess, but uh, that's how I started. And it's okay. kind of like where I am now, Charlie. Okay, Gary. Well, thank you very much. So, so uh, you, you you manage money full time, and uh, you also uh, are a hedge fund manager and the intelligent fund investor. Do you charge for that for subscription fees, or do you send it out to let people know? How does that work? I do charge for that. Uh, it's a, a monthly uh, publication. I've published it for. Uh, about 27 years, uh, I, I put one of my strategy results in there, and so uh, the intent of it is to give a, a ranking and sorting of uh, the investment opportunities on a worldwide basis, and with my own uh, uh, my own index of different uh, funds and indexes. Okay, so 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 tell us here, uh, Gary. First of all, it sounds like you invest in markets uh, through mutual yes. funds. You do not invest yes. in stocks, correct? Correct. Stocks are too hard for me. Okay, and and tell us basically by by using words that <laughs> I and our listeners would understand here. Basically, how do you do it? Do you use fundamental analysis? Do you use technical analysis? Is it quantitative analysis? What do you look at in general? We're not looking to define the secret sauces that you use, but what what do you look at in general here? Uh, In general, we don't employ fundamental, quantitative, or technical analysis. Uh, Our work is original and developed over many years, as I mentioned, Roughly 1970, I went to the library, this is before the Internet, and I tried to uh, use fundamental analysis. And after a while, I realized that because the uh, accounting systems differed from one sector to the other, that you couldn't translate uh, information from one sector to the other. So I gave up on technical analysis uh, way back when. And in the 80s, I did a lot of... uh, Excuse me, I think uh, I should have said fundamental analysis. In in the early and late 80s, I did a bunch of technical analysis to learn what was available. And at the end of that, uh, the decade of the 80s, I realized that technical analysis really doesn't work well, especially when everybody uses it, which is the case today. You know, with the advent of the Internet and uh, TD Ameritrade and uh, Fidelity and a lot of these brokerage houses now provide technical analysis for free. So my conclusion is that that all that stuff does not work. Even Charlie, you got eighty to ninety percent of all the trades in the United States come from computer programs, and no human beings are touching these trades. And so they all are programmed with technical analysis. So I don't know how individual can be competitive against all those machines all over Wall Street. So I had to. Uh, develop original strategies, um, and the market timing work I do is kind of uh, called uh, university beta strategies. So I take uh, one index and uh, crunch numbers on it and try try to figure out if a trend is going to continue or not, uh, caring about noise and signal, and try to invest uh, that way. The One of the huge problems with uh, the stock market is the noise is horrendous. And the signal is low, so you need to get some kind of a signal and filter out the noise, and that's a real challenge, Charlie. 
Yeah, well, no question about it. You and me and everybody else here. So is it basically a trend following uh, a strategy that you try to to use here? It, it is. Uh, 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 mostly it probably could be quantified that way, trying to figure out a trend. Now, as the Internet has come up and as time has gone on, the trends have gotten faster and faster. What used to be a month is now a week. And so uh, over the years, the uh, the competition uh, for this has really vastly improved. So trend following is important, but the trends don't last long, Charlie. Yeah, so uh, how, how granular do you get in the mutual funds? Do you go down to the sector level, or do you just invest in a one or more of a half a dozen you know, different diversified uh, mutual funds for international emerging markets, Europe, uh, U.S. stock market, gold, uh, bond market, etc. You know, uh, what are your potential opportunities? There? What I tried to do over the years, Charlie, is to develop something that's, that can work for a wide variety of uh, indexes and funds. So I actually have... Uh, I use a, a database from Fast Track. You probably are familiar with it. So Fast Track has a bunch of data that they publish every evening, uh, end of the day, and they have a bunch of ETFs. But I, my my own systems work on a global basis, uh, a, ver- a variety of sector bases, uh, bonds, indexes, gold. So what I've tried to do over the years is to uh, develop systems that work for almost anything all over the country, Charlie. So you can be in how many positions at one time? Do you pick one? Do you pick 14? How does that my work? Market, yeah, my market timing is for one index at a time. I call that university beta strategies. So I, I do about seven or eight uh, indexes routinely. And my, uh, my money management has uh, fun, uh, fund numbers from, say, uh, uh, three or four to about eight or nine and those I, I uh, uh, alter on a, a maybe a week or two week basis to change them. I try to. I think I have a concept that I try to follow the elephant of investing. The elephant being the uh, big boys on Wall Street that have lots of money and control the global table, so to speak. And I try to walk behind this elephant as the elephant goes through, and the strategies that they employ change. I try to follow those. Uh, with a numerical sense so that I can uh, do good and try to avoid big losses. Okay, and would you say that uh, finding out, uh, identifying the footprint of the institutional uh, investors of mutual funds, uh, etc., is that extremely hard to do? Is it getting harder, uh, easier? How does that work? You know, I don't actually try to do that, but in a conceptual way I do. So it is getting uh, harder as time goes on and the computers get faster. You know, Wall Street has moved their uh, trading computers very close to the stock exchanges so that the response time is very fast. And now it's uh, it's on a global basis. It used to be only U.S. trading, and now with the markets like they are, there's, they trade uh, 24-7. And so the competition has gotten a much much more difficult to do that. Yeah, in a conceptual way, I do try to uh, find the footprint of of the uh, Wall Street traders, and I have a lot of computer programs and optimizers and such to try to make the uh, best case I can. Okay, so let's ask this question here, uh, changing just a little bit. Uh, Gary, what do you wish that more investors and advisors better understood about investing? Uh, How to make money and not give it all back in bear markets. <laughs> That's certainly the goal. Uh, w- w- why do you think that you have been able to do that better than others? I have a sense, Charlie, uh, that 90% or maybe higher of the investment advisors and perhaps 100% of uh, individual investors are buy and hold people. So they, they never try to identify and follow an elephant as it moves along, they just buy something and put it in their drawer and keep it for six months or a year. So there's no no changes for the 
the uh, the investing process changing. Okay, yeah, no, no question about that, especially in retirement plans like 401k, often IRAs, etc. So what do you say to people when they say you cannot time the market? We've seen study after study that says that. Well, you know, uh, only about 3%, I think, of the investment advisors are able to time the market. I think most of those are primarily trained as engineers, uh, but even engineers, it's hard because not only do you have to have a sense of modeling, but the, the real problem with the market, as you well know, is the unsteadiness of the markets. And uh, I, I once did a study and published it in 2010, 10 years ago now, about how, uh, modeling the uh, U.S. business cycle. So I, I took uh, quite a, t- a long time to build this computer model. And I presented it at a talk that I gave in Jacksonville, Florida, to a whole bunch of university professors in economics and finance. And I had to run my computer model, not in real time, but I had to run the computer simulation 100 years, Charlie, for the noise in the economic cycle to steady out. And so from that, I concluded that the Federal Reserve cannot possibly control the U.S. business cycle and I was a student uh, of a lot of the Federal Reserve computer models for quite some time. Uh, but anyway, the noise and the unsteadiness is a huge challenge to this whole endeavor. So most people are not trained to keep up with unsteadiness, unsteady calculations, phenomena changing, coming in and out, sector rotation, as some people call it. That's a very crude uh, description of the market. But uh, all those things are really hard to keep up with, Charlie. Yeah, no, no, no question about it here. To what degree do you find the market to be random? I think uh, maybe 100% on a short term. <laughs> really? Uh, Define short term for pro- us. Well, within, uh, say, a week or two. Okay. That's how I would define short term. And the market okay. is, there's a lot of tools put together that uh, are for a random uh, Gaussian, if you will, distribution function, and the market is not that. It's it's not not that kind of a uh, a distribution curve that you have when you grade your students in a class, where you get half the kids get uh, pass, and you know ten percent get A's and ten percent don't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so tell us a little about. The, uh, the those that uh, become clients of yours, why do they do that? Well, they're looking for something different. Uh, uh, I think I'm a, in a small class of investment advisors who try to uh, manage client money on an active basis, and uh, I'm fee based, and a lot of uh, advisors are not, so we put, have to put clients' interest first. Also, uh, we we take discretionary authority through paperwork over the client's accounts because we do a lot of trading. Uh, and so some people uh, want a professional trading their account and others don't. So uh, if they look for someone who's experienced and uh, looking for a, a technically oriented uh, activity, that that's what we can appeal to. You, you said you, you, you use uh, mutual funds. Why do you use mutual funds versus ETFs, which is... Typically, for trading type uh, advisors, what what they use today? Yeah, uh, ETFs have come on relatively recently, uh, uh, several years. I'm not sure how many. There's been studies, and I know you've seen these studies, Charlie, that show that the uh, uh, when you trade ETFs, you get uh, you get a lot of slippage, and so if you trade uh, those things every day. Uh, for one year, you can give up 40% of your portfolio value to the slippage. So I don't like ETFs because of the slippage problems. And I trade uh, ETFs, I mean uh, mutual funds, because they're only priced once a day, and there's less chance for manipulating the prices. And uh, I've had to move to Ridex and Pro Funds primarily for my investing because uh, almost all the other uh, mutual fund families will not tolerate a lot of trading, so I've I've had to move to uh, uh, Ridex and Pro Funds. So some of the companies like Fidelity won't put up with it. 
Right, right. So what do you do, end of day trading? End of day, yeah. So, sometimes I can trade twice a day, but I actually don't like to. I like to just trade once a day. Well, it keeps it simpler, no no question about it. So what would you say, Gary, is the best advice you ever heard, read, or received about investing? Uh, buy low and sell high, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, no question about it. That that, 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 that works. That, that brings another question. Are you long only, okay, or, or no. do you ever sh- short things? Uh, no. and how, Actually, how do you do it? I'm, Go ahead. I'm short right now a couple of uh, mutual funds. So I, I have an optimizer that tries to figure out what percentage I should have in each of the funds that I select, and, the, and they're all selected by the computer program. So uh, in, in horrible times like in 08, the whole market uh, uh, is going down. Everything correlates on the downside, so you've got to be short there. So uh, I analyze uh, regularly the long and the short funds, Charlie. So uh, uh, it just depends on the market, uh, when I'm long and when I'm short. And so I, I use the computer to help me out with that because these are hard decisions. I, uh, you know, they, they've got to be gut wrenching. So, so uh, tell us uh, why the the market moves rapidly. How long do you stay in a particular position? Typically, if the market is moving fast, I might stay a little bit longer than average. I like to trade every two weeks, but sometimes it's a uh, Maybe four, maybe six weeks. I, I have to take the uh, uh, the timing from the market, and it's it's kind of hard to to know how to stay in step with the market. But if you if you stay with it long, it's like riding a horse. You can you can kind of tell when it's uh, when it's time to stay and when it's time to leave. You know, uh, with the advent of the Fang stocks over the last few years, um, and they're 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 giving such strong performances. Uh, has that made it more difficult or easier for you? That's a hard one, Charlie, because I don't trade stocks. I know what you mean about the FANG stocks. I think they're a, they're a tell on the market, probably. Uh, when you've got uh, some of the, I guess, a handful of stocks, five or six, that are doing so well, that that tells you that the ones, at least at the top, that this is a strong up market. So... In general, I, I tend to think of the market as uh, uh, being uh, organized by generals and soldiers. And so a lot of times, if the generals, like the FANG stocks, stay at the top, and you have a whole bunch of soldier uh, mutual funds underneath that are all doing well, this is great. But when the market starts to get overpriced, then a lot of the soldiers get sh- uh, shot. And so the list that I uh, monitor and calculate uh, usually gets shorter and shorter. So the the FANG stocks, or the generals as I call them, uh, they'll stay at the top. And this has happened uh, several times in the past during uh, bear markets. The list gets uh, shorter and shorter, and at some point the whole thing falls apart. But as long as those uh, generals are there, and you have enough foot soldiers behind them, the market is good like it is right now, Charlie. So, Gary, a question we'd like to ask all of our guests. What keeps you awake at night? Well, I worry about my computer models, and I, I tr- keep trying to update them and make them more powerful and m- more reliable uh, all the time. And I'm real worried about bear markets, and the market timing is very hard to pull off. And I, I worry about that a lot. Well, you're not alone there. No question about it there. And, Gary, another question we'd like to ask all of our guests, what book on investing would you recommend for investors? Our oh, there's a, a book I really like called Active Investing Wealth Management for High Net Worth Individuals. And, by the way, Charlie, I wrote that book 10 years ago. Oh, okay. And it's available on the Internet. It's 144 pages. I wrote it for uh, high net in, uh, worth individuals and uh, universities to use in their finance departments. So I think it's suitable for investing who want to know more about best practices in this financial industry. Okay. So thank you uh, for that very much, Gary, and congratulations on on writing it. So for those who would like to know more, where can they go? Uh, I have a couple websites, uh, uh, harloffcapital.com, and I have another site called University Beta Strategies, 
fiduciaryadvisoryfirm.com. So those are two websites. And uh, personally, they can reach me at Gary Harloff at Huawei.com. And my phone number, Charlie, is 440-871-7278. Okay, so you are definitely available, and we really appreciate that. So how about final words for our listeners here, Gary? Well, we have our own money alongside our client money. I think that's rather unique. We strive for performance, and we try to avoid bear markets. Not many people can do, do that. We have original models, and I don't know of many other advisors who have original models. And we have strategies to help the client's financial situations. Oh, and one last thing, Charlie. May the market be with you. <laughs> well, it's hard to avoid it uh, these days, no question about it. So, Gary, thank you very much for joining us today. This has been uh, very, very interesting, and we really appreciate it. And our best wishes for uh, yours and, and um, Harloff Capital's continued success here. So thank you for being well, with you, us thank you, Charlie. Today. Been a pleasure talking to you. Okay. Again, we've been talking with Gary Harloff, Ph.D. in Engineering, Principal of Harloff Capital Manager, uh, Management, uh, Hedge Fund Manager, and Editor of the Intelligent Fund Investor. You've been listening to Strategic Investor Radio and OC Talk Radio. And uh, we'd love to have you visit our website and listen to all of our podcasts and shows, strategicinvestorradio.com. I'm Charlie Wright, wishing you an enjoyable week and productive investing. Strategic Investor Radio is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. Content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Charlie Wright, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing.